Welcome to the Carter Banks Hour. And we are live. Uh, excuse me for one sec while I find the book. I know I stood it up somewhere, but I just forgot where. Ah. Here we go. Can't expect things to go right every time, or even sometimes. All right, here we go. Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Chapter 15, To Each Man His Own. How old are you? 26. Oh, that's quite old. What about you? I'm 16. Just think what it's like to lose a leg at 16. Where do they want to cut it off? At the knee, that's for sure. They never take off any less. I've noticed that. Usually they take off a bit extra. So that's how it is. There'll be a stump hanging down. You can get an artificial leg. What are you going to do with your life? My dream is to get into university. What faculty? Either philology or history. Will you pass the entrance exam? I think so. I don't get nervous. I'm pretty cool. Well, that's good. Having an artificial leg won't be a disadvantage there. You'll be able to work and study more intensively than others, in fact. You'll make a better scholar. What about life? Life in general? You mean, apart from study? What do you mean, life in general? Well, you know, you mean marriage? Well, that too. You'll find someone. Every tree can get a bird to perch in it. Anyway, what's the alternative? What do you mean? It's either your leg or your life, isn't it? Perhaps yes, but it might get better on its own. No, Dayomka, bridges aren't built on perhaps. Perhaps doesn't lead anywhere, only to more perhapses. You can't bank on that sort of luck. It's unreasonable. Have they told you what your tumor's called? It's one of those SA ones. That means sarcoma. You'll have to have an operation. What? Are you sure? Yes, I am. If they came and told me they wanted to cut off one of my legs, I'd let them do it. Even though the whole point of my life is getting about on foot and on horseback. Cars are no use where I come from. Don't they want to operate on you now? No. Does that mean you've missed your chance? How can I put it? I haven't exactly missed my chance. Or perhaps I have in a way. I was completely wrapped up in my field work. I should have come in here three months ago, but I didn't want to give it up. All the walking and riding made it worse. It was always being rubbed. It got wet, and then pus started coming out. Once the pus is out, you feel better. You want to get back to work. Again, I thought I'll wait a bit longer. It's still rubbing so much. I feel like cutting off one of my trouser legs or sitting about naked. Don't they bandage it? No. Can I see it? Take a look. Oh, what a... It's all black. It's been black ever since I was born. I had a big birthmark here. But you can see it's degenerated. What's that there? There three fistulas that remained after each of the three times it discharged. You see, Dayomka, my tumor is quite different from yours. Mine's a melanoblastoma, a real merciless bastard. As a rule, it's eight months, and you've had it. How do you know all this? I read a book about it before I came. It was only after I read it that I faced up to what I'd got. But the point is, 
that even if I'd come earlier, they still wouldn't have been able to operate. A melanoblastoma is such a swine, you only have to touch it with a knife and it produces secondaries. You see, it wants to live too, in its way. Then, because I waited those months, this suddenly appeared in my groin. What does Ludmila Afanseyevna say? She saw you on Saturday, didn't she? She says they're going to try to get a hold of some colloidal gold. If they do, they may be able to stop it in my groin and then smother the leg with x-rays. That way, they'll postpone... They'll cure you. No, Dayomka, it's far too late to cure me. Nobody's cured of a melanoblastoma. There just aren't any instances of recovery. In my case, cutting off a leg wouldn't be enough. And where could they cut higher up? The question is now how to postpone it, and how much time do I stand to gain? Months or years? That is, you mean you're going? Yes, that's what I mean. I've accepted it. Dionka, but living longer doesn't mean having more life. The real question is, what will I have time to achieve? I must have time to achieve something on this earth. I need three years. If they give me three years, I won't ask more than that. And I don't mean three years lying in the clinic. I mean three years in the field. Vadim Satsirko and Dayomka were talking quite quietly, sitting on Vadim's bed by the window. Only Yefrem in the next bed was within earshot. But ever since morning, he had been lying there like a block of wood, never taking his eyes off the ceiling. Possibly Rasanov could hear too. Several times he had looked amicably at Zatsirko. What do you think you'll have time to do? Asked Dayomka, frowning. Well, try to understand. I'm teasing a new controversial idea. The great scientists in Moscow seem to doubt whether there's anything in it. My theory is that you can discover deposits of polymetallic ore by looking for radioactive water. Radioactive, you know what that means. There are hundreds of different indications, but you can prove or disprove anything you want on paper. However, I feel that that's exactly it. I feel I can prove it in practice. It means I have to be out in the field all the time and actually find some ore using this water and nothing else as a guide. Preferably, I should do it more than once. But the work. While you're on the job, you have to waste your strength on all sorts of trivial things. For example, there's no vacuum pump, only a centrifugal one, and to start it, you have to suck out the air. How? By mouth. That means I get mouthfuls of radioactive water. We use it as drinking water. Anyway, the Kyrgyz workers say, our fathers never drank here, so we won't either. But we Russians drink it. Why should I be afraid of radioactivity when I've got a melanoblastoma? I'm the obvious one for this work. More fool, you! Yefram's expressionless, rasping voice broke in on their conversation. He didn't even turn his head. Clearly, he'd been listening to every word. If you're dying, what do you need geology for? It won't do you any good. You'd better be off thinking about what men live by. Vadim held his leg in one position, but he turned his head freely on its supple neck. His black, vivid eyes flashed and his soft lips trembled slightly before he replied, with no trace of offense. I know the answer to that already. People live by creative work. It helps a lot. You don't even have to eat or drink. He was gently knocking his fluted plastic mechanical pencil between his teeth, watching to see how far they'd understood him. You, read this little book and you'll see. You'll be surprised. Again, Podiev spoke without moving his body or looking at Zasirko. He tapped one rough fingernail against the little blue book in his hand. I've already gone through it, 
Vadim's answer came back swiftly. It doesn't belong to our age. It's too shapeless, not energetic enough. What we say is, work harder, and not just for your own profit. That's all there is to it. Rusanov started, his spectacles flashing amicably as he asked loudly, Tell me, young man, are you a communist? In his simple, easy way, Vadim turned his eyes toward Rusanov. Yes, he said gently. I was sure you were, declared Rusanov triumphantly, raising his one finger. He looked exactly like a teacher. Vadim clapped Dionka on the shoulder. All right, off you go. I've got work to do. He bent over his geochemical methods. In it was a piece of paper. He was using it as a marker, covered with finely written notes and big exclamation and question marks. He began to read, the black, fluted mechanical pencil moving almost imperceptibly between his fingers. He became absorbed. It was as if he was no longer there. But Pavel Nikolaevich, encouraged by the support Vadim had given him, wanted to bolster himself up before his second injection, and decided to break Yefrem once and for all, to stop him spreading gloom and despondency. He looked at Yefrem straight across the room, from wall to wall, and began to address him. It's a good lesson the comrades just given you, Comrade Podiev. It's wrong to give in to illness, as you've done, and it's wrong to give in to the first priest-ridden booklet that comes your way. It means, in effect, that you're playing into the hands of, he wanted to say, of the enemy. In ordinary life, there was always some enemy to point to, but who could the enemy be here, in a hospital bed? You should look deep into life, you know, and above all, study that nature of achievement. What motivates people to achieve high productivity? What made people fight heroically in the last war against Germany, or in the Civil War, to make another example? They were hungry, without shoes, clothes, or proper arms. Podiev had been strangely immobile all day. He had not gotten out of bed to stomp up and down the aisles, and what's more, several of his usual movements seemed to have gone. He'd always taken care not to move his neck, and had only turned his body reluctantly, but today he'd moved neither hand nor foot. All he'd done was tap one finger against his book. They had tried to make him take some breakfast, but he said, it's no good licking the dishes if you haven't eaten enough at the table. Before breakfast, and ever since, he had lain there, quite motionless. If he hadn't blinked every now and again, you might have thought he'd turned to stone. But his eyes were open. His eyes were open, and, as it happened, he didn't have to move an inch to see Rusanov. Rusanov, with his way face was the only thing in his line of vision, except for the wall and the ceiling. He heard Rusanov lecturing him. His lips moved, and out came that unfriendly voice. But this time, the words were more blurred than ever. What's that? Civil war? You fought in the civil war, did you? Pavel Nikolaevich sighed. You and I, comrade Podiev, he said, are not of an age to have been able to fight in that particular war. Yefrem sniffled vigorously. I don't know why you didn't fight. I did. Pavel Nikolaevich pointedly raised his eyebrows behind his glasses. How can that be possible? Quite simple, said Yefrem slowly, taking a little rest between each phrase. I picked up a pistol and went and fought. It was quite something. I wasn't the only one. And where was it you say you fought? Near Izivsk, we were sorting out the constituent assembly. Asterisk next to constituent assembly. The non-Bolshevik majority of the constituent assembly, the Russian parliament, organized short-lived resistance to the Bolsheviks during the Civil War. I shot seven Izevsk chaps with my own hand. 
I remember it well. Yes, he really thought he could remember all seven of them, grown men, and exactly where he, a mere boy, had brought each of them down in the streets of a rebel town. The fellow in the glasses was still lecturing him about something, but today he felt as if his ears were blocked up, and if he surfaced at all, it was not for long. That morning at dawn, when he'd opened his eyes and looked at a patch of bare white ceiling, for no particular reason, a long-forgotten and quite insignificant event had come into his mind with a jolt. It was a day in November after the war. Snow was falling, turning to slush as soon as it touched the ground and melting completely on the warm earth, just thrown up from the trench. They were digging for a gas main. The depths had been specified as one meter, 80 centimeters. Podiev, walking past, saw it wasn't yet dug to the proper depth. But the foreman came up to him and swore blind that the whole length of the trench had been properly dug. Very well. Do you want us to measure it? It'll be worse for you, Podiev took a measuring stick with a burn mark across it every 10 centimeters, every fifth mark longer than the rest. And they went off together to measure, getting continually stuck in the sodden, soggy clay as they went. He in high officer's boots, the foreman in ordinary soldier's ones, they stopped at one place and measured. One meter, 70. They went on. In the next place, three men were digging. One was a tall, thin peasant with a black growth of beard all over his face. Another was an ex-officer who still wore his army cap, although the little red star had been torn off long ago. It had a patent leather rim and peak, and the crimson band was caked with lime and clay. The third was a young guy in a cloth cap in a townsman's overcoat. In those days, there was a lot of difficulty about providing prison clothes. They weren't issued with regulation ones. What's more, the overcoat must have been made for him when he was a schoolboy, because it was short, tight, and threadbare. It seemed to Yefram now that he was seeing the overcoat clearly for the first time. The first two were still digging, the ground wearily, dragging up the earth with their spades, although the sodden clay stuck to the iron. But the third, just a stripling, was leaning his chest against his spade as though transfixed by it. White with snow, his hands tucked deep into his wretched short sleeves. He was hanging from it like a scarecrow. They'd given the men no gloves. The ex-soldier had a pair of high boots, but the other two had nothing but improvised shoes made out of car tires. Why aren't you standing there gaping? The foreman shouted at the boy. Do you want to go on punishment rations? Okay, that's fine by me. The young fellow just sighed and sagged. It looked as if the spade handle were going deeper and deeper into his chest. The foreman gave him a clout on the back of the head and he shook himself, starting to poke about with his spade again. They began to measure. The earth had been chucked out on both sides of the trench, close beside it. You had to lean right over the ditch to get an accurate view of where the top notch on the measuring stick came. The ex-soldier stood around pretending to help, but in fact he was holding the stick at an angle to gain an extra 10 centimeters. Podiev swore at him obscenely and held the stick up straight himself. The result was quite clear. One meter, 65. Citizen commander, the ex-soldier pleaded softly, please let us off the last few centimeters. We can't manage them. Our bellies are empty, our strength's gone, and the weather, well, look at it. And get myself put on charge just because of you, huh? Think up another one. Those are the specifications. All the sides must be straight and no dip at the bottom. As Putyev straightened up, pulled up the stick and hauled his feet out of the clay, the three turned their faces toward him. The first, black stubbled, 
a second looking like a winded hound, a third with fluffy, down, untouched by a razor. Looking up at him, the three faces no longer seemed alive as the snow fell on them. The young fellow forced his lips open and said, All right, chief, it'll be your turn to die one day. Podiev had not written a report that would have them thrown in the cooler. He merely recorded what they'd earned so as not to bring their bad luck down on his own head. Looking back, he could think of plenty of people he'd been harder on than them. All that had been ten years ago. Podiev didn't work in the camps anymore. The foreman had been released. The gas main had only been installed temporarily. Probably it wasn't carrying gas anymore, and the pipes were being used for something else. But what had been said then had stuck in his mind, coming to the surface today. It had been the first sound in his ear that morning. All right, chief, it'll be your turn to die one day. There was nothing for Yefrem to set off against this memory and screen him from it. Did he want to go on living? That young fellow had wanted to as well. Did Yefrem have an iron will? Had he learned something new and did he want to live differently? The disease took no notice of any of this. It had its own specifications. There was, of course, the little blue book with the guilt signature, which had already spent four nights under Yefram's mattress. It was humming to him about the Hindus and their belief that none of us die completely and our souls transmigrate into animals or other people. These specifications appealed to Podiev now. If only he could take something of his own with him, not let the lot go down the drain. If only he could take something of his own through death. Only to him, this transmigration of souls was just a lot of hogwash. Pain was shooting from his neck right into his head, ceaselessly. It had started to throb evenly in four-beat time, and each beat of the bar was hammering out. Yefrem Poryev dead, stop! Yefrem Poryev dead, stop! There was no end to it. He began to repeat the words to himself, and the more he repeated them, the more remote he felt from the Yefrem Poryev who was condemned to die. He was getting used to the idea of his own death, as one does to the death of a neighbor. But whatever it was inside him, the thought of Yefrem Podiev's death as of a neighbor's, this, it seemed, ought not to die. But what about the neighbor? It looked as if he couldn't escape, except perhaps by drinking the birch tree fungus brew, only it said in the letter you had to drink it regularly for a whole year. For that, you need two poods. Asterisk next to poods. A pood is an old-fashioned Russian measure of weight, equal to 36 pounds. Wow. You'd need two poods of dried fungus. Four, if it was wet. That would mean eight parcels. The fungus should be fresh off the tree, too. It shouldn't have been lying around. So, the parcels couldn't be sent all at once. They would have to go one by one, once a month. Who was there who could pack them up and send them off at the right time? Who did he have back there in Russia? It would have to be someone close to you, a member of your family. Hundreds of people had passed through Yefram's life, but no one he'd gotten close to enough to call a member of his family. That first wife of his Amina might be the one to get the stuff together and send it. There was no one on the other side of the Urals he could write to except her. But she'd only write back, just drop dead. Wherever you like, you old wolf. And she'd be right. She'd be right according to the Book of Rules, not according to the Little Blue Book, though. The Blue Book said Amina ought to pity him, love him even, 
not as her husband, but simply as a man suffering. She ought to send the parcels of fungus. The book was very right, of course, so long as everyone started living by it at the same time. Then Yefram's ears cleared, and it got through to him how the geologist was saying he lived for his work, and Yefram tapped the blue book with his fingernail again. Once more he sank back into his own thoughts. He didn't hear or see anything, and the same shooting pain continued in his head. All that bothered him now was the shooting pain. If it hadn't been for that, it would have been so easy and comforting for him to lie back without moving, without treatment, without eating, talking, hearing, seeing. Simply to stop existing. But someone was shaking him by the foot and the elbow. It seemed the girl from the surgical ward had been standing over him for some time, trying to get him to come and have his dressings changed. Now Amajan was helping her. So for no good reason at all, Yefram had to get out of bed. He had to pass on the will to stand to all 210 pounds of his body, the will to tense his legs, his arms and his back, to force his flesh-laden bones out of the torpor into which they'd begun to sink, to make their joints work, and lever their bulk upright, to become a pillar, to probe that pillar in a jacket and shift it along the corridors down to a staircase, to be uselessly tormented, to have dozens of meters of bandage unwound and replaced. It took so long, and was so painful all around him, there was a sort of gray noise. With Yevgenia Ustinova were two surgeons who never did operations on their own. She was explaining and demonstrating something to them, and talking to Yefram too. But he did not answer her. He felt that they had nothing worth talking about. The indifferent gray noise blanketed all their words. They wound a hoop around his neck, even mightier than the last, and he returned to the ward with it. His head was now smaller than the bandages wrapped around it. Only the top of it stuck out of the hoop. He ran into Kostoglatov, who was on the way out with the tobacco pouch in his hand. Well, what have they decided? Yefram thought to himself, what have they decided? It seemed as if nothing had got through to him, but by now he understood what they had meant and replied as if he'd known all along. They said, hang yourself where you'd like, but don't do it in our house. Federau gazed in horror at the monstrous neck, which might be his fate too, and asked, are they discharging you? It was only when he heard the question that Yefram realized he couldn't do as he wanted and go back to bed. He had to get himself ready for discharge. After that, although he couldn't even bend down, he had to put on his everyday clothes. And after that, although it was beyond his strength, he had to trundle his pillar of a body through the streets of town. It seemed intolerable to have to bring himself to do all of these things. Goodness knows who or what for. Kostoglatov looked at him, not with pity, but with sympathy, one soldier feels for another, as if to say, That bullet has your name on it, and next may have mine. He knew nothing of Yefram's past life. He'd not even made friends with him in the ward, but he liked his bluntness and reckoned he was far from the worst man he'd met in his life. All right, Yefram, let's shake on it. He held out his hand. Yefram took his hand and grinned. When you're born, you wriggle. When you grow up, you run wild. When you die, that's your lot. Oleg turned to go out for a cigarette, but a lab girl appeared in the doorway. She was taking around newspapers, and since he was the nearest, she gave it to him. Kostoglatov took it and opened it. But Rasanov spotted him and loudly, in hurt tones, 
reprimanded the girl, who had not managed to scuttle away in time. Listen here, listen. I told you quite distinctly to give me the paper first. He sounded really pained, but Kostogotov had no pity on him. Why should you have it first? He barked. What do you mean? Pavel Nikolaevich was suffering aloud, suffering from the indisputable and self-evident nature of his right, which it was impossible, however, to defend in words. He felt real jealousy if someone else, with unhallowed fingers, opened a fresh newspaper before him. No one here could possibly understand a newspaper as he did. He regarded newspapers as a widely distributed instruction, written in fact in code. Nothing in it could be said openly, but a skillful man who knew the ropes could interpret the various small hints, the arrangement of the articles, the things that were played down or omitted, and so get a true picture of the way things were going. This was why Rusonov had to read the paper first. But as none of this could be said aloud, he just complained. They're going to give me my injection in a minute. I want to see it before I have my injection. Injection? Bone Shewer softened. All right. He cast his eye rapidly over the paper, where reports of the Supreme Soviet session had squeezed the other news into the corners of the page. He was on the point of going for his smoke anyway. The paper rustled as he started folding it to hand it over. When something caught his eye, he dived back into the paper and almost at once began to utter one long word, repeating it guardedly, as if grating it finely between his tongue and his palate. Interesting. Interesting. Beethoven's four muffled chords of fate were thundering above Kostogatov's head. Nobody heard them in the ward. Perhaps they never would. What else could he say aloud? What is it? What is it? Rusanov was getting quite worked up. Give me the paper immediately! Kostogatov made no attempt to point anything in the paper out to anyone. He didn't answer. Rusanov either. He gathered the pages of the newspaper together, folded it in two, and then in four, as it had been originally, except that now the six pages were a bit crumpled and the creases didn't fit. He took a step toward Rusanov, as the other took a step to meet him, and handed him the paper. Without leaving the room, he took out his silk tobacco pouch. With trembling hands, he began to roll a cigarette out of the newspaper and crude homegrown tobacco. Pavel Nikolaevich's hands were trembling too as he opened the paper. The way Kostogotov had said interesting had struck him like a knife in the ribs. What could it possibly be that Boneshewer found interesting? Deftly and efficiently, he leapt from heading to heading through the reports of the Supreme Soviet sessions until suddenly it was set in quite small type and would have had no significance for the uninitiated, but to him it shrieked from the page. It was an unprecedented, impossible decree. The whole membership of the Supreme Court of the Soviet society had been changed. What's this? Matulevich, Orich's deputy, Detistov, Pavlenko, and Klopov? Since it had existed, Klopov had been a member of the Supreme Court, and now it was dismissed. Who'd look after the state and party cadre now? A lot of completely new names, all those who'd administered justice for a quarter of a century, gone at a single stroke. It couldn't be a coincidence. It was history on the move. Pavel Nikolaevich broke into a sweat. It was only just before daybreak that morning that he had managed to calm himself down, persuade him that all his fears were groundless. But now, your injection. What? He jumped like a madman. Dr. Gangart was standing in front of him with a hypodermic syringe. Roll up your sleeve, Rusanov. Here's your injection. And that concludes Chapter 15 of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Read to you by Carter Banks.
That was a good chapter. I can just picture this guy, Pavel Nikolaevich, like... Solzhenitsyn is so good at painting these characters that I can picture him... I can almost draw him. He's like the, uh... The uptight, by-the-rules party character. Like, nerdy. But, like, also... Very bourgeois. And he's just freaking out that he's going to be, you know, disowned by the party or executed. And he's just starting to calm himself down. Then he sees the newspaper and everything's, uh, all these changes. And he's like, oh, fuck. And then right as he's being able to think that, he gets snapped back to reality by his injection from Dr. Gangart. Very great. This is great imagery. This book is awesome. Anyway... I will read chapter 16 tomorrow at 9 p.m. Central Time. We're not even halfway through this book. But I am halfway through editing chapter 1. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I appreciate it. I'm excited to read the 16th chapter tomorrow. It's called Absurdities. And I wonder who it'll be about. He seems to be going from character to character. I will see you all tomorrow at 9 p.m. Everyone be safe, and thanks for tuning in.